Hello, and welcome to chapter three of our read-through of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. I'm Jem, the reader at St John the Baptist Parish Church in Beeston, and in this episode we'll be discussing Edmund and the Wardrobe, all the way from Lucy ran out of the empty room into the passage and found the other three, to please your majesty, said Edmund, I don't know what you mean. I'm at school, or at least I was. It's the holidays now. As with previous episodes, I'll be talking about the things that particularly struck me or made me pause and think as we look at this chapter. So this is the chapter in which Lucy comes back from Narnia, tells her siblings about what she's found there, they look into the wardrobe, they can't find this magical land she claims exists, they understandably disbelieve her, they think she's making it up for a joke or a hoax. Then there's another game, and Edmund finds his way through the wardrobe into Narnia and meets a figure who will turn out to be the White Witch. Perhaps the first thing I noticed, or particularly paused on in this chapter, is the various responses to Lucy when she comes back. So she says, oh, I, I found Nana, it's amazing. It's a magic wardrobe, there's a wood inside it, and it's snowing, and there's a fawn and a witch, and it's called Narnia. Come and see. I wonder whether that come and see is a biblical echo. I know I'm claiming there are all sorts of textual resonances here that may or may not be there, but come and see is a phrase that has been repeated so frequently in sermons and reflections over the years that I wonder whether there's a little echo there. But either way, when Lucy tells her siblings about the magical land, they obviously don't believe her. Peter went in and wrapped his knuckles on it to make sure that it was solid. A jolly good hoax, Lou, he said as he came out again. You really have taken us in. I must admit we half believed you. But it wasn't a hoax at all, said Lucy, really and truly. It was all different a moment ago. Honestly, it was, I promise. Come, Lou, said Peter, that's going a bit far. You've had your joke, hadn't you better drop it now? Peter's response strikes me as another interesting touch of fictional psychology from Lewis here, because the, the clash that happens between the, within the family here is because of their virtues rather than because of their vices or weaknesses. Lucy insists that she's seen what she's seen, that there was this magical land inside the, the wardrobe or that you got through through the wardrobe, because she loves the truth, because she's not going to sort of go along with things for an easy life or uh, sort of win people's approval by saying something that isn't the case. Peter, on the other hand, maintains his position because he's also seen what he's seen. He's seen that there isn't a magical land there, um, and he's a bit concerned about Lucy later on in, in the book that she's saying things that aren't true. Edmund, of course, is a slightly different matter. Edmund seizes upon this as an example of weakness in Lucy and uses it to sort of tease her and taunt her and ask her if she's found any other magical lands and cupboards all over the house. But Peter and Susan's response is because of their honesty and their good-heartedness. I also wonder whether there's a, there's a slight touch of the attitude to faith uh, and the experience of the, the, the more than natural, the more than material, that Lewis experienced in Peter. Um, it's, it's striking that Peter's first response is to go and look for it, and then when he doesn't find it, say, oh, that was good, that was a joke. A, a gracious way of saying, oh, it, it's, a, it's a point against me, I see you've taken me and isn't that good. Giving Lucy an out so that she can say, oh, yes, it was only a joke. Uh, and him saying, oh, come on, that's, that's pushing a joke a little bit far, and she insists on it. It's gracious, it's humane and civilised. I sometimes hear in this passage that perhaps the voice of a, a senior academic at Lewis's college who doesn't see why Lewis has to be so earnest about everything, why he has to be so insistent on, on a singular truth. There's an interesting uh, sort of air of Peter of trying to keep the, the siblings together as they're away from, from their family. And he tries to do this by smoothing over exactly what it is people are claiming that, that is actually the case. Um, and of course it doesn't work. As I say, it, it's, it is an interesting moral dilemma here in that the clash in the family comes from their virtues, their insistence on, on truth rather than uh, any, any weakness or any flaws in them. That moral question is extended, I think, when Edmund finds his way into the wardrobe. So there's a, a passage here. Uh, Lucy gets into the wardrobe. She did not shut it properly because she knew that it is very silly to shut oneself into a wardrobe, even if it is not a magical one. Clang! The third, fourth possibly time we've heard that phrase in the book so far. Very good. Your, your health and safety in, in magical fiction there. Now, the steps she had heard were those of Edmund, and he came into the room just in time to see Lucy vanishing into the wardrobe. He at once decided to get into it himself, not because he thought it a particularly good place to hide, but because he wanted to go on teasing her about her imaginary country. He opened the door 
and such and such and such, and he finds his way through the coats into the wood, as Lucy did. Now, that also made me pause there, that we're told definitely that, that Edmund didn't go into the wardrobe because he thought Narnia might be there. He didn't even go into the wardrobe because it would be a good place to hide in this game of hide-and-seek. He got in there because he wanted to keep winding Lucy up about it. And, of course, Edmund and Lucy have quite different experiences when they first go into the, uh, into the wardrobe and into the land of Narnia. For us, I think it makes sense that they see the... the the two sides of the, the the war that's going on, or the, the struggle that's going on in Narnia. And from one point of view, their two visits simply give us, the reader, different insights into this fictional world that Lewis has created. But I wonder whether Edmund's sort of bad behaviour, Edmund's selfishness and snideness, has warped his experience of Narnia in some way. I was just slightly reminded of the bit of Jekyll and Hyde where Jekyll is talking about the, the transformation which the potion has upon him and he speculates that perhaps the reason why his, his alter ego was his evil self rather than his good or higher self was something to do with the, the hubris or the arrogance or the, the moral state he was in when he took the potion first of all and that released something and it, it took him down a particular moral path. I don't insist on this, but I think it's interesting that we're, as I've said before... We're being shown the psychology and the the personality of these characters before they go into the magical land, and then that gets extended and uh, expanded when they find the, their way in. The book seems quite insistent. There's a continuity between the characters before and after their experience of Narnia and, and through their experience of Narnia. And I wonder whether Edmund... L Lucy has offered the experience of Narnia that uh, a character like hers, innocent, trusting open receives and Edmund receives the experience that a character like his perhaps slightly sly perhaps slightly on the make certainly one who respects strength and has an opportunity to torment weakness whether he receives the appropriate uh, experience there he gets the chance to join the witch's side anyway as I say just a speculation so when he goes into Narnia we have this scene where uh, he calls out to Lucy, tries to find her, he can't find her. And he, again, we're told, though he did not like to admit he'd been wrong, he didn't also much like being alone in this strange, cold, quiet place, and he shouted again. Lewis seems really determined to lay bare Edmund's uh, sort of moral machinations, uh, the fact that he doesn't always act honestly or straightforwardly and that he has, he's someone who has ulterior motives. Um, it seems you might you might see this as a bit of pre-damnation for an author who's designing a character who uh, he intends to to fall into a into a great sin later, so he's sort of heaping it on. But again, I think there's this question of, of moral continuity, where Edmund is someone whose actions have a double quality to them, and that's going to be expanded later. Anyway, so he, he does this, uh, this shouting, can't find her, just like a girl said Edmund to himself, sulking somewhere and won't accept an apology. Again, we're given an example here of someone who imputes probably the, the, the worst motive, or certainly not uh, a good faith motive to someone else. He doesn't assume that she's out of earshot, or that she's scared, or that she doesn't want to meet him. He assumes that she's sulking because she doesn't want to have to accept his apology and then things being all square. This is the kind of moral psychology I think we find in Lewis's other writings, particularly the screw tape letters, where some of his most penetrating insights into moral behaviour, I think, are about everyday life. The Screwtape Letters are a, a series of imagined letters from a senior devil to his, his junior cousin, and they're about uh, life under wartime conditions, but about the pettiness and the irritation and the way in which actually it's not the grand terrors and the grand dangers of wartime that are endangering people's souls. It's smallness, it's pettiness, it's selfishness, uh, betrayal, all the small traits um, which can grow to great sins. Yeah, so I think something similar is going on here. And then one of the central figures of the novel arrives. He looked around him again and decided he don't, did not like, much like this place and had almost made up his mind to go home when he heard very far off in the wood a sound of bells. He listened and the sound came nearer and nearer and at last there swept into sight a sledge drawn by two reindeer. The reindeer were about the size of a Shetland pony and their hair was so white that even the snow hardly looked white compared with them. 
Their branching horns were gilded and shone like something on fire when the sunrise caught them. Their harness was of scarlet leather and covered with bells. On the sled driving the reindeer sat a fat dwarf, who would have been about three foot high if he'd been standing. He was dressed in polar bear's fur, and on his head he wore a red hood with a long tassel hanging down from its point. His huge beard covered his knees and served him instead of a rug. But behind him, on a much higher seat in the middle of the sledge, sat a very different person, a great lady taller than any woman Edmund had ever seen. She was also covered in white fur up to her throat and held a long, straight golden wand in her right hand and wore a golden crown on her head. Her face was white, not merely pale, but white like snow or paper or icing sugar, except for her very red mouth. It was a beautiful face in other respects, but proud and cold and stern. So as I say, this is going to be one of the central figures of the novel, The White Witch. And we're introduced to, to her in quite an interesting way. I think there's a bit of a bait and switch going on here because there's the sound of bells, then we see reindeer in a snowy landscape, then we see a sledge, then we see a little dwarf who's wearing polar bear fur and has a cap with a tassel. I think, and I say this is just speculative, I think we're supposed to think this is Father Christmas. I think we're supposed to expect a big, jolly, paunchy man who's dressed in scarlet and white, or scarlet with white detailing, and who's going to give gifts and make things cheerful and jolly. And the opposite happens. She's a woman, she's thin, she's tall, she's dressed in white with scarlet detailing, just on her, on her lips um, and on the harnesses, and she's someone who takes away rather than giving. This is a feature of the White Witch's character, which I'll expand on, because I think it's, I think it's religiously or theologically significant later on in the book. But it just struck me that there's a bit of a fictional game being played here. We're, we're being led to expect the kind of character we'd think of in a snowy landscape, driven by, uh, dr pulled along by reindeer in a sledge with a little man who seems to have come from the North Pole on it. And instead we're presented with someone who seems to be the opposite of that person. And that not only surprises us, and I think gives us a, a, perhaps a similar sense of shock to Edmund in that we, we had an advantage over him because we'd seen Narnia before. Um, and if we were listening, we'd know that Father Christmas wasn't be there because it's always winter but never Christmas. But there's a, a, a shock for us as just as there's a shock for him and we get a sense of surprise in the reading of the novel. But also the very, the very inverse qualities which the witch shows, I think, throws into relief what's not here in the novel. We don't have gift-giving, we don't have jollity, not in this scene at least. We don't have uh, a land that is moving through the seasons healthily and wholesomely because it's, it's frozen in time. Uh, time itself has, has come awry somehow. And I think by the, the very bait and switch that's going on, it brings to our mind things that should be present in Narnia, but clearly aren't. In fact, their inverse is present. So those are just a few of the things that, that came to my mind as I was reading. I'm sure, as I said before, there'll be things that strike you as you read this chapter, and I'd be really interested to hear about them, so please do leave comments. Next episode, we'll be discussing the chapter entitled Turkish Delight, one of the things that a lot of people remember about this novel, all the way from... But what are you, said the Queen again? Are you a great overgrown dwarf that has cut off its beard? And all the way to... Come on then, said Lucy, let's find the others. What a lot of adventures we shall have now that we're all in it together. So I look forward to discussing that with you soon.